So design in the boardroom is a really interesting topic because we normally don't talk about design and boards. We'll talk about design in practice, we'll talk about it as design thinking, we'll talk about design strategy. But when you get into the boardroom, you actually wind up either having people who will be an accelerator for the design project or they're likely to go and be a break. And so we're going to go and explore a little bit about what a board is, what design in the boardroom looks like. But Laura, can you help me out? Because you have such an interesting CV. You're currently the chair of Launch Victoria. You're an investor in a range, I won't say what you're an investor in, but you're an investor in more things that we can poke a stick at. And you've also got some non-executive director roles that you've got. Yes, that's correct. Would you like to hear my perspective on being a good company director? I would love to hear, because mm. who, who's actually friendly with company directors? Who knows uh, enough board members? Yeah, so we've got some yeah. people here. They're an interesting group. They normally don't socialise with, uh, with as many people as you might imagine, but they're actually quite friendly people. Laura's an example of that. So help us out your perspective on the company director and also design. Thank you, Mark. So friendly versus effective, right? We can be both, really key. So what is an effective? What's the role of a board? You know, what's the role of a... Uh, a chairman of the board, and it's really about two things. It's about conformance and compliance, but then maximizing performance. And in today's day and age, to really ramp things up, so we have startups and scale-ups, and then on into this next generation. Did any of you hear Kate Cornick give her talk earlier? Yeah, she was great, wasn't she? Like huge, fantastic content there in the speech, and it, it's talking about the entrepreneurial ecosystem that exists here in Victoria. But if you look at the forces that are at play, and again, what is the role of a board, but the forces at play right now tied to this fourth industrial revolution, right? You guys have heard of that. I'm sure many of you have. It's front and center in disrupting and transforming all industry sectors as we know them. So what does that mean? Mega, mega, mega opportunity, right? So as a company director, what happens? Mm, there can be quite a bit of fear, right? Fear of what you don't know. And so what I find is um, the challenges and opportunities for organizational maximum performance, global competitiveness, comes into the alignment between the board and the executive. So board plays a role, but how does that happen? Well, I believe it always starts with the chairman and the CEO, so the relationship there. And then from there, what do you have to do? You have to make sure that you remove, in, in the case of the role that I play and the boards that I'm on, is I think I have three key roles. One is plant seeds and act as the sand in the oyster. Second, what I do is I try and maximize and open doors wherever possible. And the third thing I try and do is every once in a while and say, I put a gust of wind in the sails, and if no one's getting it, I go, come on, come on, come on, and I grab the hand, burn that darn platform, and say, we've got to go now. So as a board, what's the role of the board? As I said, I go back to the beginning. It's about performance, but it's also conformance and compliance. But I think the greatest challenge is people don't know what they don't know. And that's where the entrepreneurial mindset is so fundamental. And I also think as a, as a director, you look at what's just happened with the Banking Commission, right? The four biggest banks, pillars in the nation, what's going on there? So huge opportunities. But I think, again, the more we can all work together to design the future, and I can come back to that later, but uh, again, I'm really committed and passionate to maximizing board's contribution. Laura, thank you very much for that. Well, we're going to come back and as we begin to unpack this, we'll also look at the role that committees have with boards, because uh, Laura's actually also served on the audit committee of, of one of our listed org organisations. And what's interesting about that is that that's where you take your head off or take your hat off as much as being an accelerator and actually beginning to get in and saying, have we accommodated the risk, has due diligence, has, has the propriety that we want in the, in the conduct of the organisation be looked at. And I think if we don't explore committees, we're not going to actually fully understand how you're enabling that board process and the design culture that's in there. So Kirsten, help me out with, um, with the exposure that you get to, to board conduct as the Senior Vice President of Experience for Oracle Aconex. And I should help you out there. Oracle's broken into three companies, is it? 
Well, it's essentially 140,000 people, and then they have a separate area, which is kind of their, what they call global business units, which are where the innovation supposedly comes from, and I'm in one of those areas. So their construction engineering area, which is kind of Contech, it's doing um, technology for the construction industry. And so that's the area that I'm in. Um, I think, how many here, people here are designers that we're sitting out of there? So there's a, a fair few, and product people, like so product managers, all of that. So I imagine sometimes you're sitting there and you're thinking, where the hell did these decisions come from that I'm having to deal with now, right? And so typically, I'm on the exec, so the exec is typically the ones that are making the decisions that then you're having to live with half the time. And I think coming up through... Um, from a user experience slash product person and coming on to an executive, it's what I realized was it's really just another design problem that you're facing, right? Like you come onto these, these boards and you're dealing suddenly with a different type of design problem. You have to work out who your audience is. So what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And in this case, it's usually whatever the, the exec is dealing with and what the board are dealing with for the company. Who's the audience and who's going to actually benefit from this? And often it's your customers, it's your stakeholders, it's the board as well. And then how are we going to measure success? And I think as design and product people, that's always the challenging one, right? Like you're dealing with an area where on the board it's always about what's the revenue, what's the profit, what's the margin on these things? And you're coming from a different perspective. And I think a lot of people come onto these roles and think suddenly everybody's going to listen to what I have to say because I am coming from this, you know, customer and user perspective. I've got all of these kind of, I've got the people, of the, I'm the voice of the people of who we're dealing with. And what you have to realise is that you have to be able to speak their language still. Otherwise, you will be ignored and they won't listen to what you're saying. So it's really key as design people that we understand the mechanisms of an organisation. What runs the business? What are the key things? What are the key drivers? You can't separate yourself from that, but by understanding that, you can start to influence it and you can start to get your language through the boardroom. And for me, I've just been at an exec offsite the last couple of days, and what was really fascinating was, you know, we've been talking about jobs to be done. Who knows jobs to be done? They're dealing with it all. And it's been something that, you know, I've been doing probably for about 15 years now. And we've, you know, we started the dialogue about four years ago at AConnex. And what was fascinating was to hear the exec group all talking about jobs to be done, right? And that's when you know that you've actually had this impact. You're starting to get the dialogue that you're used to and working in, but it's starting to enthuse through the organisation. So that's the really key thing. It's saying, how can we take our language, how can we take our understanding so that everybody gets it, and it's not just in this pocket of designers, creative people who are sitting in the corner doing all the thinking. We need everybody on that same train as us. So I think that's really the key then. We're collaborators, we're thinkers, we're problem solvers. How do you bring those kind of techniques and thinking into the boardroom? And that's hopefully the perspective I kind of try to bring with what I do. I know you've got a perspective on this too, Harriet. <laughs> so, Harriet, now help us out. You're at IAG, Insurance Australia Group. How are you seeing design interacting with, uh, from the design practice, in the C-suite and into the board? Well, I think, um, I think Laura touched on it already. I mean, performance and regulation. So anybody who hasn't had a hat or headphones on for the last two days solid would know that regulation is a, a massive challenge. But I think in terms of where does design fit, we often think of ourselves as not being involved in the development of regulation or not really at the front end of performance. If we're going to design things for our customers that are new and innovative, then we have to be able to ensure they desi they're designed within a regulatory framework. And rather than being boring, that's actually a hugely exciting challenge as a designer. The tighter the constraints, the more opportunity there is for innovation. And in terms of the boardroom, it's remembering that performance and regulation are important to Kirsten's point. How do I make this tangible enough that somebody who doesn't spend their days in my field can understand it? How can I make this relevant enough that they can understand that changing this piece of design is going to make it simpler for a customer to understand, which makes it easier to buy, which is going to increase performance? And I think for us in terms of IAG, we've been lucky enough to have a, a company that's invested in design practice 
it helps us bring the right people together in the room to share information at a different speed. Um, and again, to sort of touch on both the points, we're having to move faster than ever before, and boards are having to make decisions faster than ever before. So how can we bring together the right people to create not the right answers, but enough of a piece that will give them confidence to help us move to the next piece. It's just like getting funding, except it's getting buy-in or getting um, acceptance. And it's actually, I think to Kirsten's point, it's probably one of the more exciting and more undersold parts of, of, of my career. And, and so in those three descriptions that we've had there, we've seen quite a diverse range of understandings of what design and boards means. And I think there was an interesting, almost from my perspective, an error that I saw that, that Kirsten, went, you, you went into, which was you asked who's a designer in the room? And there's a category trap question because we have people who have a degree as a designer, but we're all involved with making the most efficient and effective decisions to create performance inside an organisation. And if you're doing that, it's got to be human-centred design because human-centered design is a proven and effective way to deliver what people want. So you can be driven by design without necessarily being a designer. So before we had, who are the designers in the room? If you can go put your hands up for me. Okay, who's product people? Keep your hands up, designers, yeah? Who's driven by design to actually go and help create outcomes in their organization? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of hands that went up that didn't come up before. And that's a, that's a very simple thing there about culture and language, which is how do we enable people to realize that they can use the design principles and the design language and the design methodologies without necessarily having to be a designer. And I see, that, you know, in the first talk that we had today, Stephen turned around and he talked about how design's gone from being about an artifact into now being more about strategy and culture inside organizations. And so our language around who's the designer is actually failing us because it's taking away the right for board members to actually be inspired by the efficiency and the power of design because we're telling them they're not designers. And so it's really important that we work out how to empower them. And I know Harriet and I had a very interesting meal about six months ago where she was trying to actually reserve that space that if you're, no, you've I got wasn't. to be a qualified <laughs> designer. And what was interesting about that, she was both right but she was also wrong. And I think the area that she was right is we need to have masterful designers who go very deep. And we also need to have the people who are moving across the top at an executive level. And we hear a lot of that about having T-shaped people or I-shaped people. And in our, in our preparation for this, we were talking about a conversation about strategy, culture, craft, and following the money. And if we're all on that same journey about we're trying to go create economic outcomes, and those economic outcomes require deep mastery, masses of you know, hours that people have in expertise in the area of design. We will also need that to be supported the whole way up through, through the organisation to people like Laura who can be inspired to say, what if we did what the customers wanted? What if we created the next thing that they don't know that they want but they will know in the future? And if we haven't enabled the board level to do that, then we don't have the opportunity for the masterful designers to get there. Can I, can I Certainly, just answer yeah, always. That? The, the point I was making was essentially that I think if we're going to use design in the boardroom, we need to be very clear between the difference of design in organizations and designers in organizations. And the point I was making was that evidence-based design is something that if we try to turn everybody into a designer, we, lack, we, we lose the evidence, and that actually loses our anchor and our chain to the performance and the regulatory change. So I'm arguing for great designers in organizations who follow evidence-based practice and who follow great skills, who can also talk about and bring people on their journey in the same way that a CFO would be able to influence the investment slate of a board, a great designer needs to be able to influence the investment in design. So I, I, I am trying to distinguish, actually, I think one of the, the holes we've fallen down in early embracing of design in boards is this move away from evidence-based practice and a promise that we could do everything. What I'm arguing for is more, where do we apply design for its most effect? And it's, it's important that we actually understand those tensions that exist there, because language is failing us when it comes to design. And the language that's failing us is, is somebody driven by design or are they a designer? And there's a massive gap. 
If I went into the finance sector, we have so many different role titles that people have, and if you mentioned any one of those particular jobs, they all have a defined definition. I go to a lot of design conferences and people will argue over the difference between UX and UI and experience design, and actually it goes over the top of a lot of people's heads. So we need to actually have an open and embracing attitude so that we're enabling. And I think earlier today when I was speaking to Laura, we were talking about the companies that are actually showing the most performance and are accelerating the fastest are the ones that have a complete stack from the board, C-suite, and also their design practices in there. Great you know, evidence-based design, great leadership of what's possible and what, what could we imagine. And then they've also got the, the conduct that's, here, that's going on amongst the C-suite, that they know how to manage up and they also know how to manage down so that they're creating those design outcomes. So, Kirsten, can you help me with some examples? Because I know that, that uh, Aconex Oracle, that you spent a lot of time working out how to go and actually bring design as proven outcomes. And I know you went through an acquisition recently, and there, I, there was an anecdote around your experience maps that came up that may not have been fully utilised day to day by the executive suite, but when it came to the acquisition, they came back to the fore. Yeah. It's, um, I think bringing, when I first joined Aconex, there was essentially one user experience person and no product, no, no, nothing else, basically. So re really building, helping to build um, the product practice with the co-founder, but um, also the user experience side into a global user experience and product team. So in the end, I think before our acquisition, we had about 72 people globally. Um, and now with Oracle, what's really interesting is that when we are acquired, and I don't know anybody who's gone through an acquisition, but it's a very interesting time. And, um, and so you go through and you don't really know where you're going to end up, right? Like you don't, you're the company being acquired. But what was really interesting there is we were able to talk about the practice, right? What we actually do, how we view the customer. And all businesses are basically looking for growth. Like everybody is saying, how do I get continual growth? And we tapped, we've always tapped into that and said, you don't get growth unless you get happy customers and people using your products. If you do, you can, tame, you can basically create the flywheel, right? People who are happy tend to keep on using the products, tend to spend more money, stay with you, get more customers and grow. So bringing that perspective, we basically had to pitch to Oracle and say, really justifying what we were doing. And what's ended up happening is we are now running product and experience for Oracle. Right, so we inherited all the Oracle team as well and basically are running that globally now. And why was that? Well, we could show that we had an insight really detailed into the customer experience and what is happening with our customers through that journey. And what was really interesting, working with the founder, the CEO, many years ago, we'd done this whole experience map of the customer experience. And he was like, I don't know why we're doing this, Kirsten. Like, we know our customer experience. You know, everybody knows our customer experience. And I'm like, no, we, you, people are coming into the organization that don't. There are touch points throughout this that you are not aware of. We need to get this down. And we went ahead and did it in the team. And, um, and it was always a bit of skepticism. So, so sometimes people say, you have to have everybody on board and all the rest. I, I don't believe that. I think sometimes you need to do the right thing and you know that there's gonna be some value down there, somewhere down the line. And um, what was really interesting, we were able to show the value of that really quickly because what happened was we'd mapped the experience and um, the first experience our customers are having what was called bill shock. So they would sign up for a project. The sales guy would say, oh, just give me a date when your project's starting. It doesn't matter. You know, we'll just put it into the system. The client would say, oh, OK, yeah, here's the date. And then suddenly, even if their project hadn't started, four weeks later, they get an invoice. And they're saying, what the hell am I getting charged for something I'm not even using? And so we were able to show. And the, so the poor finance team had been getting irate customers. And the sales guys didn't care because they'd been getting their commission. And so we were able to take this and sh say to the CEO, this is the first time experience a customer's having with us, apart from using the product, but look at the friction that is happening across the organization. So the value was seen then, but what was really interesting when Oracle came in, they were like, wow, okay, so you guys do understand this journey end to end, and basically accepted that we'd done that work and saying, okay, how can we change our customer experience? 
experience? How can we go on this journey with you? So I think it's really important sometimes to get those wins, get those stories, and be able to share and have that. But ma the main thing is being able to carry that across the organisation. Because we weren't the ones that were just talking about that mapping experience and everything. Everywhere across the organisation was referencing it as well. So it wasn't just the UX team that was doing this. It was seen as a company-wide thing, and that was equally important. So ultimately, we become facilitators in this process as well. And, uh, and Laura, as far as what you're seeing with, uh, with Launch Victoria, with uh, uh, the role that's there, where does design fit in for these early stage startups? Because my perspective is that most of them are actually, they're made for investment, they're made for growth, and they've got to balance out how much human-centred design they go put in, how much ex exploration there is on core technologies, core need. What's, what are you observing there with the people who are involved with Launch Vic? Yeah, well, um, we have our CEO in the audience. Kate, do you mind standing up, please? Dr. Kate Cornick, the most amazing executive. I okay, love let's give Kate a big round of applause. Come on. <laughs> I love working with Kate. It's an honor, as you know. She's one of the most amazing CEOs I've ever worked with. So um, you start talking about what is the role of Launch Vic, but I, I might bring that back to, that's all on the website. Right, Kate's presentation summarized the amazing um, ecosystem that's been created by all of us here in Victoria and where we sit on the world stage. It's amazing. We're the fifth largest, fastest growing startup ecosystem in the world. So it's, it's incredible. So that energy is there, right? We've stimulated the molecules. We, and I say all of us, right? It's working as one team. So that, if you go think about that, that's an amazing piece of system design of taking disparate organizations, a disparate activity, and then bring it in so we can actually refer to it as an ecosystem. Yeah, yep. Without a doubt. And, and so you start saying, what is the role of boards, right? So the Launch Vic board is there, I believe, you know, it's, it's all about, uh, there was a great quote once upon a time that talked about a leader's job is to set the frame, and then within that frame, set people free to create. Now, create to what end? So we can argue, and we talked about this earlier today, yeah. we can say on behalf of our customers, and I say, well, of course, you know, define your customer. Is it internal customers? Is it the board? Depends what you're trying to achieve, right? So you come back to that. But because of, I'm back to this fourth industrial revolution concept, and there are so many uncertainties in the marketplace right now, aren't there? And that's why, Mark, when you asked the question, you know, who are the designers out there? Who are the product developers? I held up my hand on purpose. Right? Yeah. It wasn't me saying, everyone hold up your hand. It was because I see that responsibility to think laterally mm -hmm. and to embrace that whole concept of innovation is a role all of us have to play. So I guess I just wanted to say that. Okay. And then, Harriet, I know that there's been some work that's been particularly challenging in the insurance sector that's come around since the sharing economy which obviously creates risk to the organisation because people are now driving their cars for a commercial reason rather than just a private reason. The board's identified that there's a risk. The design team come along and actually create some new products. Can you tell us a little bit about how design was able to go and help respond to that board risk need to create new economic opportunities and defray the, the risk that was in the marketplace? Big question. And, and, and if it's commercial <laughs> and you can't, uh, in confidence, I understand, but... No. I, I can talk to some of it, and I think, Laura, you just touched on it a little bit around how, what are the frameworks, and, and in, you know, we've, we've talked about journeys. One of the things that we're looking at inside IG has been, what are the frameworks that enable you to build a future-facing practice? So journeys are great for today's experience. They're great for moving away from today's experience towards a better one. But in a world which is consistently turbulent and uncertain, what, how do we hold m multiple possible futures in hold. So a journey can only tell you where we are. Actually, what we need to be able to do as organizations is say, to say, what if there were no cars and we sell car insurance? What if climate change means that we have to change the way we live on the Gold Coast? And these are really big, really imminent questions to us, which means the organization needs to share knowledge in new ways. And what do designers do well? We combine and recombine knowledge in ways that are unusual to generate new thoughts. So for me, the power of design in our organizations is to allow us to develop very rapidly multiple possible futures so that we listen differently, so that we share knowledge differently, and therefore our design can fit. And, and you asked me an example. Um, we've been working with um, 
everything from how do we start to prepare, um, how do we t tell you if, if your car's had an accident, we can talk about how do you ensure a single thing, not multiple things. We're working on how can your home be safer? We're working with building materials and we're trying to understand the impact of what happens if the climate changes by all of the different degrees that the UN has put in place. But what that means is back to Kirsten's original point was that you have to understand the materials of your organization. So for us as designers, we have to understand how risk is modeled. And, and I suppose a, a very interesting thing about an insurance company is that they're already, they, the culture of scenario planning and what if thing is already inside the organization. So to be able to turn around to them and say, well, let's go plan for future scenarios, you're already well set, there's a high state of readiness. Whereas if you went into an organization that hadn't thought about that, but they were just thinking about mm. the current product range, there's a different you know, ramp up stage, isn't there? So, so you were kind of blessed with the fact that yeah. the organization had a challenge, it had some culture, a strategy was come up, came mm -hmm. up, and then you were able to go and actually do the design practice to deliver. I think one of the things I was always told was strategists, um, strategists describe, sorry, strategists describe to make and designers make to describe. And in previous times, we've actually been fighting over who does what. Actually, if you put the describing to make and the making to describe together, you have a way of working really fast because when the board says do this, you can make it quickly and you can go, do you mean that? And they go, no, 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 not that. And we go, well, customers like this one. So the idea of making something tangible, I think, is massive in terms of the application of design to making quick decisions. Yeah. And I, I, one of the things I was looking forward to in having Russell Howcroft uh, here today was Russell is also, he's a recovering um, uh, marketeer. <laughs> he, he, Russell's world used to be to go out and to, in the most proven and effective way, get people to buy things that may not have actually been what they needed, may not have actually have been what service they need, but he was able to go make things move. And if you go look at where he is now at PwC, his role there is now actually coming down to more about making things that people want and helping to transform organizations. And so I was very interested as a past creative director myself saying, well, what's his journey been in leaving, in being dogmatic and telling people what they have to have into actually beginning to be responsive to what they, what they actually need. And, and that's, that change is happening at the boardroom, that they're asking, can we be more efficient? Can you stop actually spending so much money on marketing? And probably the global example of that is Microsoft. Microsoft have dramatically, they've taken their marketing budget down because what they did was they became more human-centered and they actually were making products that people wanted and they put the effort into making things that you wanted and had delight with, rather than telling you what you needed. And so that pattern that's going on is something important to look. Where is the tide in the organization and who's the champion for actually doing what people need, rather than the people who are trying to get them to want something? Yeah, Mark, if you don't mind, you know I have to go. I but, do. But I had a couple things. I'm looking at the title of the discussion, right? It's design is bedded in the boardroom and the age of the design executive. And I thought, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd leave everyone with just a couple thoughts. Certainly. Now, Is Laura's going to be interchanged with somebody else, but hit us with your best shot before we uh, say farewell to you. All right, thank you. All right, a couple key things, takeaways. So it depends on where you are in your evolution. So remember what I said. Think of the title of today's presentation and, again, why you would have opted in to be here in the audience today. And I mentioned the role of a board. Doesn't matter if it's a board of a you know, Fortune 100 company or a startup board, but the board has two fundamental responsibilities. It's about conformance and compliance to legislation and other things. They have to ensure the systems are in place. They have a fundamental responsibility to do that. But then on the other side, it's also about enhancing performance. So how do they go about carrying out their duties? There's three key things that have to have clarity, and that comes back to the board operations. It's around strategy and clearly understanding that. It's about risk and risk management, but if you want to be effective in engaging with the board, you have to understand the risk appetite, and there's a lot of tools around that. And then the third thing is around governance structures, and Mark, you mentioned about subcommittees and things, but just think strategy, risk, and governance. Now, what comes after that? I think really important. I'm just, I have something here. If you want to understand, there's a company director magazine, right? So 
Launch Vic without a doubt. If you're a startup, a scale up, engage big time with Launch Vic. You know, all the tools are there. It's incredible, the website. As you're looking and, and with an eye to growth, it's amazing. Just, you know, opt in, look online, um, understand what governance restrictions and opportunities the, the um, I guess, the global boards are looking at. So that's a really good one. But look at this one. It's about space. Fascinating, isn't it? Look at the last edition, really, really fabulous. So it also talks about from here, I can list a hundred different new startup opportunities and ideas that just come from the opportunities, constraints that are still yet to be articulated. And those are the things that keep us awake at night. Those are the things that are the fears of being disintermediated, right? And all the things that could happen. So I just wanted to say that because that's the fusion between existing businesses and industries and the new future of work, right, and future of opportunity. And then in closing, if you want to influence an outcome, right, we talked about the art of influence. I find there's four, and Karen, you know I say this all the time, you know, you need to be able to clearly identify who you're selling to. If it's a board, right, then there's four key buyer types. I find this is a really good discipline. So try and experiment with this in your next foray. The first is you have to find the economic buyer. That's the person who controls the dollars, right? They can write the check, and it comes out of their budget, and it's never a committee. It's an individual. So you have to identify the economic buyer. Second thing you have to do is you have to identify the user buyer. Those are people who are influenced by the outcome of your value proposition and what you're pitching. And it could be marketing, it could be operations, it could be product design, and you need to be able to show the value of what you're doing to them in, a, in terms that they understand. The third thing is a technical buyer. Those are the ones a lot of people spend a lot of time, waste time actually on, trying to sell them. All they are are people in the organization who can say no, right? They can. <laughs> We've all been there, haven't we? You know, you can do the best thing possible, but they say, sorry, you know, an IT person, oh, it doesn't fit with our architecture, right? All right, could be something like that. So you need to understand those people and you just neutralize them. And then the fourth type of buyer is what I would call the coach. And the coach, if you have a coach who's an economic buyer, right, and has influence in the organization, you're in a really good place. But the coach just has to be respected by all your buyers and then, you know, your value proposition gets through. So just wanted to say that. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Laura. Now, how about a big round of applause as Laura goes and disappears for her next important thing. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, Andy Hoyne is going to come up on stage uh, now. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much. Andy's a very interesting gentleman because he runs, uh, and he's going to take the big steps. Wow, look at this. Well, good to see you, Andy. Andy um, is from Hoyne Design and is also the author of a, of a book which is about the place economy. Now, property marketing used to be something which was, can we have a brochure so that we can sell this particular property development? And then a few smart people got in and said, well, how about we actually make the place desirable that people want to buy it rather than just a building which isn't really selling because it's not meeting people's needs. And so that's where the idea of placemaking came in. And he's been involved with that for a, a, a number of years, has another book which is going to launch when? Uh, it launches actually in this room in exactly a month. In a month's time, so there'll be a launch here for the right. Place Economy Edition 2. This is the last one. And it's a great <laughs> read in there. But I think what's really interesting is to, to go from saying we're doing a branding and marketing exercise for a piece of property into influencing how do you get 10 or 20% more yield out of the same property, and how do you move the inventory by a factor of two to five times faster, all of a sudden you're having a economic impact conversation, and you're doing something that boards like. So Andy, help me out, the first time that you went and had a conversation about placemaking and you said, I can accelerate the economic outcomes here, do people believe you? Did they just think you were the branding guy, or did they understand that you had some more potency there? So firstly, I would never talk about placemaking. I just wouldn't. Because placemaking is interpreted as being a very sort of social initiative, which has no commercial outcome. And as the speakers have already outlined here today, the only way that you can actually achieve your desire is to speak in the language of your audience. So when I'm talking to boards, um, it's very much about understanding who they are as a profile. Um, one, I've always lamented that traditionally, the majority of boards are made up of CFOs and lawyers. Uh, ex-lawyers or ex-CFOs. Now, 
I would love to see the future, and it's starting to occur, obviously, where design thinkers, doesn't matter what discipline they come from, but design thinkers actually play a key role in helping navigate the future of organizations. And that's already occurring. You know, um, in my previous talk today, I mentioned that you know, in the past of the, our design industry, it was made up of uh, small, large, independent design agencies. But now design thinking is probably being more predominantly led as a saleable service by your Deloitte's, PwC's, KPMG's, et cetera. These are the organizations that have kind of taken the lead in terms of charging the premiums. So they have had a better ability to sort of find themselves in those positions of power, and so the conversation has completely changed in terms of the value that design thinking brings to the benefit of a, an organization of any size. So I didn't even answer your question, which was place making. So just to go back to that question very briefly, again, it's not about trying to use your articulation or your words. And in the context of that, it was about saying, let's focus on actually achieving a higher rate per square meter. Let's achieve far more people who actually desire to live or work or visit and shop in a particular place. Well, how do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is you convince them that it's all about the money and the yield and that it won't actually return 200 million, it'll actually return 280 million. Um, you're going to capture their attention pretty quickly by using those numbers. But in terms of how you do that, it's about actually creating a compelling differentiated destination. Now, that might seem so obvious and simplistic, but in development from a government point of view or for private enterprise, what's happened in the past is the notion of risk mitigation. Risk mitigation has been about doing the same thing again and again. We did it last time, it worked, let's do it again. Now, risk mitigation has been turned on its head because if you do the same thing again and again, no one gives a shit. No one's going to pay a premium, no one's going to line up. How do you actually get people to be as excited as hell about a new place? Do something incredible. And this is interesting because boards traditionally haven't been used to these conversations because they love risk mitigation so much that they like doing the same thing again and again with a 2% adjustment. But I'm talking about flipping things on their head to actually increase profits exponentially. And I, I think what I love about, like I know your book and everything, I've been watching what you're doing, it's amazing. Um, it's, I think if, just into picking up what you were talking about there with, you know, the angle that you had to go in, like you couldn't really just lead with what you wanted to. And I think sometimes as designers or product people, we want to, you know, we're authentic, we want to be true, we want to lead with that kind of statement. This is about improving people's lives, this is going to, what you come to, and I remember, so example, a number of years ago, I was working on a product that was um, for the accounting industry, and it was riveting stuff, and um, basically had gone, and it was a pitch to the exec group, and I was saying, and you know, you laugh about now that you'll be brand names that you'll pick up straight away who use this kind of wording, but I said, we are going to create an accounting product that people are going to love. Like, it is going to delight people, right? So this is about 15 years ago, mind you. The exec group laughed at me, right? I'm standing there, and I was like, okay, this is one of those moments that can go either way. And I said, well, okay, we will get the revenue that you're getting on that current product within six months' time that is currently taking you two years. That is what I'm committing to. Oh, okay, <laughs> now we'll go and do it. So it was, what was really interesting with that was, you know, I was trying to lead on a hearts and minds kind of angle. And because you're dealing with people and people are all emotionally, you know, we've all got emotions, we think that's going to drive. And it is really key and important when we're designing experiences and everything. But you have to remember that these guys are wired into the return. And if you can't speak in those things and, and have both of those angles, so we still kept that hearts and minds value when we were designing that product. And it was amazing. But you have to be able to come at the angle of your stakeholders as well. And, yeah. and Kirsten, so earlier on we were talking about language came up. And what I think is very interesting there is the language of your nouns were their verbs and their verbs were your... So, so you've got this interesting thing where if you want to go and actually sell something to somebody and get them to adopt it, you've got to be speaking their language. Well, Carry it, please. I think... I, I, know, I was just listening to Kirsten and I was thinking about... Um, a story I was thinking, we were talking about this in our team the other day, and if you look at what Elon Musk has done, what he's done is the reason he got, it, yes, space is exciting, and yes, it's all wonderful, but actually he sold it on the reduced cost of a payload to space, 
and if you look back at the sort of first rockets and the first spaces, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars per kilo of payload into space. When you go and look at his presentations, he often speaks about the, the low cost of a, of a payload into space. So he's doing exactly what Kirsten said. It may be a really innovative technical product, and he may speak to the industry like that. But what he's selling to his investors is the cost of cheap okay. um, cargo to space so, travel. So what I'm going to do there is get into a little bit of technical language about rational and non-rational decisions. We've got boards are responding very well to rational propositions. We're going to make you more money. That's why we've got in part of this, follow the money. You know, you can say whatever you like about the non-rational part of a project, but if you don't happen to put in the rational part, which is about it's going to make more money, it's going to save more money, you've actually, you've missed your opportunity. Because the payload that's, uh, that's being heard is what does it do economically? You can talk about it being lovely and delightful, but what we know is if we don't make it lovely and delightful, it's not going to have the user adoption. It's not going to have that acceleration of the market. But what the people that are going to approve it want is that it has an economic rational perspective. What the users want is a non-rational perspective. And it's working out how to balance those two. And it's walking a fine line where you're not selling out from your integrity, that you're actually using language and delivering what people who have authority are after, helping them to get to their goal, and then making sure that you're reaching the user's goal at the same time. And there's a real mastery in being able to go do that. Fortunately, we've got a lot of people who have had those skills who have moved out of being design studio leads now into chief design officers, chief marketing officers, chief innovation officers, so they're there. But they're probably having to go use different language, and don't be surprised that they're talking about a rational concept on something that you know is a very non-rational delivery to the customers. Um, interestingly, I always think that as designers, uh, we can traditionally get fixated that we're about you know, pictures and words. And when it, we get introduced to the kind of concept of numbers, it's like, well, that's actually for the finance people. But if you actually think about most of what we do in the design industry, um, you, know, you might create a brand plan or brand DNA. That's a business plan. That's a business plan just by another name. And the same thing applies when you think about the way that you're actually presenting a concept and presenting market-leading advantage. The client often, and certainly at a board level, they're not interested in the idiosyncrasies. And the way that you articulate that is far better positioned if you're actually talking about a business plan or better, a financial model. And you think, what the hell do I know about a financial model? It's so common sense. You don't need a degree to figure out financial models. Where are the revenue streams, the alternative methods of achieving an outcome, uh, the different audiences? They're just variations on the components of a financial model. And anyone in this room who understands their audiences can build a simplistic financial model and actually think of alternative ways of achieving a far better, far more lucrative outcome for your client. And the way that you present that will be with open ears from the other end of the room even though all you want to do is sort of scream design and talk about user experience and how fantastic it's going to be. You just have to be really careful about the way that you pitch it, you sell it, and the way that you get it approved. So, Harriet, help me out here. In summary, because we're going to get to some questions here, what do you think is your number one trick in making sure that a, a project or an initiative that you got that you manage to get it through that it actually doesn't get choked in the process, that it actually sails? I don't have a number one, it's not really a trick, it's more about in the same way as you design something, critique it. Try, try pitching your, your thing to people who don't understand your thing. And if they ask you what the value of it is or they don't understand the questions, then you've probably got it wrong. And in the same way as if you, if you use a test something and people don't know what it does or what it, it's for, then that's a failure of the design process. So my number one trick is, is to understand your audience when you're talking to a board, and if, if they're being driven by revenue performance and growth, how do you sell your thing in that context? So maybe taking a human-centered design to the board themselves and meeting the user's need. Yep. OK. How about you, Kirsten? I was just, I was just thinking, I wonder if he's going to ask me that same question. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what Harriet's always saying. Um, I think also that, as I said earlier, it's, it's approaching things exactly as you would a design problem, right? So you're always going to be thinking, what's the problem or, or the need? Who's my audience? And how am I actually going to measure success? Like, how am I going to frame that to the audience that I'm speaking with? 
But the other key thing, and I see this happen a lot across our industry, is that you have to be able to execute. Okay, there's a lot of talkers out there who love to talk and have the language and all the rest of it. Ultimately, where your seat and taking a seat at the executive table comes up down to can you deliver on what you're talking about? And so I'm a really strong believer in being able to lead by example and then taking your seat once you've got those examples and, and things that you can share in the stories. So really think about what I'm talking about, you know, if I'm pitching something or going through this, how am I actually going to get to the next stage and be able to execute and show that value? Because that's all that really matters. Nobody cares about the strategy that you came up with and that it was perfect and the design and all the rest of it. They care about the outcome. What are they left with at the end of this thing? And if you can't get to that stage and show value, then it's all been for nothing, really. Like, you might have had some great experiences along the way, but you won't be remembered for actually impacting and sharing value with the organisation. Andy. Think about a board like a bunch of politicians. They have a very clear agenda that they have predetermined for themselves that is supposed to align with the overarching organisation, but doesn't always. So it's very difficult to go into a room and actually pitch to a group that you assume are aligned, but half the time hate each other's guts. That's just the reality. So my advice is that when you want to get a great outcome from presenting to a group of people such as this, don't go in blind. Plan well ahead. Meet as many of them as you can one-on-one -on -one as individuals. Just have a coffee. Be very casual and actually talk through your thinking in really serious, simple business terms and get their feedback and either accommodate it or post-rationalise it or you know, build it into the way that you actually present it. But wherever possible, never go in and present an idea where the first time they hear it is you standing in front of a panel of people. Ensure that you've actually done as much work with the individuals up front as possible so when you go into that room, you pretty much should know what the outcome's going to be. And, and I think, Andy, you've got some fantastic advice there because if you've had a coffee with, uh, with the person, they understand that they've been heard and that their needs are being met, they'll stop from being somebody who is giving assent to all of a sudden being a champion. Mm. And when you've got people on the board who are championing the great vision that you have, they'll go and they'll use some magic language at exactly the right time, which will get the others to come across the line. So thank you very much for that. Thank you.